I guess we are ready to start. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome uh, to our uh, eco civilization talk, uh, which is this time dedicated to communities, uh, communities in uh, the eco civilization, um, a topic that we are going to um, explore with our um, speakers, our guests uh, that I'm going to present in uh, a few uh, minutes. Um, we are uh, pleased to having you uh, back in such a high number where we see some, some uh, regular participants, we see some new uh, faces. Uh, welcome uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Yuri Giacometti. I'm the, uh, the host of uh, this uh, um, stream together with um, the curator of the Echo Civilization. Uh, Violeta Bultz, who is uh, here with us and um, who will um, uh, take the, the word in, in a few minutes. Allow me to, to say um, that um, uh, to, to, sh to uh, remind you of the house rule. Yuri? Yuri, you froze. We've lost the connection with Yuri, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, let me call him. Okay. But we are, the rest of us are online, right? So let's just wait for Yuri to, um, uh -huh, he's back. <laughs> Perfect. I guess the connection uh, is very bad in the, in the mountains. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's a connection. Yeah, but you know, it, it's like wind. It, 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 comes, it comes back uh, sooner or later. Uh, do you hear me now? Hello? Yes, Yuri. Go ahead. Okay, you can, you can hear me. Okay, okay. So the connection uh, uh, has improved. Um, we uh, uh, some of the uh, some of the sessions of this uh, stream uh, are supported um, uh, by the uh, public fund for uh, scholarships um, and um, uh, professional training of the Republic of um, uh, Slovenia, which supports this stream um, uh, by the European Union uh, funding. We are very thankful. To that and this makes it possible to be uh, freely accessible and free uh, of charge for everybody. Um, we see uh, the eco civilization as the final destination of uh, of the social trajectory. Uh, we build around uh, the need for uh, decoupling. Uh, we would like to depart away from a general market uh, failure and build upon the three dimensions of uh, sustainability. This is what we normally uh, do um, in many other forms as well uh, within the, the, our circular business um, academy. Uh, intend is to entrepreneurs, managers, experts, investors, policymakers, researchers, uh, and all other um, you know, curious uh, people engaged in the civilization paradigm uh, shift. We do, we do this in very many ways, as, um, um, as you see. We, um, uh, and in, in many uh, different uh, formats of uh, uh, training, incubation uh, at uh, the corporate and uh, systemic level, uh, we also engage in financing facilitation. Um, so why, why this stream on, on the eco-civilization? Um, we are, of course, pressed by the change, but we would really like to know where, where we are going, right? And what is our desired destination? That's why we would like to imagine this, uh, uh, and we would like to do this together. That's why we are uh, um, going on with Violeta, and we try to in engage you in, in this uh, uh, very interesting um, exercise. We believe that, firstly, it um, helps us you know, getting closer to our, our goal. And uh, secondly, this is a journey across a landscape of paradigm change. So it's not a, an easy uh, and a short journey. 
uh, it depends on many factors uh, whether we are going together or not. Uh, so um, there are many paths that lead there, and not, not, not only one is the, the right one. And um, uh, imagining our journey together definitely helps us uh, avoid some of the uh, pitfalls and uh, 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 and uh, help societies uh, get get closer. We are deeply uh, convinced. So it is, it is an imagination exercise. Uh, the outcome is desired scenarios and uh, uh, and, and uh, lessons uh, how to to avoid um, uh, fallacies on, on on the way. We would like to remind you of our essay content. Uh, we are. Uh, um, going to publish um, your essays on, on our um, CBA conversations. Uh, as you know, you can also uh, suggest uh, readings that uh, inspire you and could contribute to uh, the overall uh, conversation. Uh, th today we host two very interesting speakers, uh, right, Violeta? Um, uh, Ladaya godina Kosher and Einar Klepe Holte. Uh, Ladea is the founder and uh, executive director of uh, Circular uh, Change, uh, an internationally recognized um, leader in the circular economy, uh, the finalist of the Circular Awards of the World Economic Forum in uh, 2018, um, and uh, she is involved in the uh, European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, um, seated in Brussels now for the second term. She is the co-author of the Roadmap to the Circular Economy um uh, of uh, in slovenia and uh, regularly uh, speaks and, and publishes um, on the topic of um, the circular economy Einar, um, uh, Einar comes from norway he's the founder of the natural state a company uh, dedicated to a natural approach to urban uh, value creation uh, he has uh, extensive experience in uh, the, the development of uh, and implementation of environmentally sustainable uh, business models, um, scaling up uh, uh, models from a local to a global uh, scale. And since 2011, he has been teaching about the concept of development and branding at the Emergence School of Leadership in Oslo. Welcome, uh, both of you. Uh, we are happy to uh, to having you. Uh, before we uh, start uh, the debate, uh, let me remind you of a very simple uh, house rules. The rule number one is please speak up, please participate. Um, you can you know, raise your hand, uh, you can you know, ask for it and you will get the word. Uh, you can also use the chat box. Um, and if you think uh, uh, by any chance you may get a uh, little r rumors for any uh, event that may happen behind your back, please mute your uh, microphone uh, on time. And of course, uh, please do your homework, send us the, uh, the essays, we will be happy to read them and, 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 and publish them. We uh, really appreciate your, your uh, active contributions in many ways. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, the materials are available on uh, the CBA uh, website. Um, after uh, the webinar, just as well as um, all, all the previous ones. Uh, so thank you for uh, all for uh, for your participation. Um, welcome uh, again, uh, all the speakers. Uh, the debate can start, and I would like to pass uh, the word to uh, Violeta now, uh, to uh, uh, so that she can. Um, uh, introduce us with the topic and uh, make the, the initial connection between uh, the eco civilization and uh, the very topic of communities. Violeta, please. Thank you very much, and uh, warm greetings from my side as well. Uh, this uh, journey of discussions on eco civilization is getting more and more inspiring, and uh, even though that uh, we don't have thousands on our webinars. Uh, the messages of uh, and questions are coming from all over the world. And uh, look at the attendance today. We have people from Argentina, Japan, Netherlands, Slovenia, and I'm not really sure where Margojata is from, but it sounds like Polish. So, um, but so we have a very very diverse. Um, uh, group and that's uh, what gives me hope that we will be able out of the diversity 
uh, get some really good global ideas uh, on uh, how to move forward. How, India as well, of course, Ryan, uh, sorry not to mention you, uh, who is our ambassador in India, really. Uh, and um, it's, um, it's just the fact that the more turbulent the world is becoming, more calm we need to be. And uh, out of this uh, really uh, quiet, is from the quiet space, hear the voices that uh, show us the way forward. And I, I really hope that today's conversation will also open some very fresh new uh, points of view. We have excellent uh, uh, colleagues who will help us to explore this topic, but each of one of you can contribute its own uh, thoughts. And because we're from all over the world, um, this is the only way how to understand the global awareness and the global uh, the global consciousness, uh, how it is evolving and uh, how we can find our own space within it. So discussion of today, as uh, Yuri has mentioned already, uh, is uh, communities and eco-civilization. So let me just first uh, bring you up to speed with, uh, with, with the concept that has we were able to evolve so far and uh, places, communities right at the center of it. So uh, you know already that uh, already, uh, I'm not sure if really the, Jean, uh, the, the Lennon can, uh, is the author of the war, uh, statement, but uh, he certainly was the one who uh, used it a lot. If I dream by myself, I dream. If I dream with friends and other people, I create. So that's why I do hope that um, what we are creating uh, is something that uh, will be able to broaden the view and give us all more chances to see beyond what is happening right now. Um, often we say we first need to know why. Why is the purpose? Why is something that is driving us from inside out. So uh, I do believe the challenges we are facing today and uh, we are able to communicate also on a global scale with each other uh, are just asking us to be bold, more bold, um, not to be trapped with the existing systems, but to dare to change them and to dare to show the way forward. And uh, that's how I see the concept of eco-civilization as some sort of joint new destination and uh, which is not predefined. The steps are not predefined. The steps are co-created as we go. Uh, and how can we get there? Uh, as we said, we can get there by just being able to imagine things, but that will not be enough. We already saw in some of our sessions, for example, in the discussion of health, we are able to also develop new concepts and deliver them. And we were, we shared them uh, with the EU um, special groups. Uh, and that's something I'd like to do in the future too, that whoever can use this material, go ahead and share it. Don't be shy, don't hold back. Um, it doesn't need to be me or Yuri or um, those co uh, speakers, but anyone can use this material. We would be happy if you report back, but uh, go ahead and, and, and use it because we can evolve only together. No individual can do it on its own. So what are really eco-civilization's potential characteristics that we could follow if we say that uh, we have a hypothesis uh, that uh, eco-civilization is a possibility? It will emerge from a global planetary consciousness. If you look back, most of the civilizations that we are aware of today came from one particular geographical location. Uh, within a particular cultural setup. I do believe that we are ready to deliver something from a global consciousness. Uh, it will focus on something that matters to life. Right now we are focusing primarily on tools, on financial markets, on economy, on health, on education. These are all tools for us to live better. So I do hope 
we will be able to, to, to focus on what are the essential elements of our existence, which is beings, not only humans, but all other beings that are part of this beautiful planet Earth, societies which bring uh, beings together and help us to jointly achieve our shared goals, land the, the, where we stand, where we produce our food, where we get all these uh, beautiful resources from, awareness, which is a collective wisdom and, and knowing uh, that we as human beings collected over centuries. And I hope that uh, finally we can create a civilizational paradigm that will be integrating uh, the previous knowledge because so far every civilization pretty much destroyed the previous ones and uh, showed the power and strength by conquering and not by cooperating. And I, I'm a bit... Um, optimistic that we can join our forces around three major goals, which is Earth as an echo zone of galaxy. Populate, that our goal is to populate other planets based on more sustainable circular models and discover a new law of physics, which will help us to understand better what life is all about. Uh, I hope, and this is part of the hypothesis, the technology will be replaced as a driving force um, by a new element, uh, and I feel that this could potentially be a relationship so that the, ne the next civilizational paradigm could be relationship-based paradigm where relationships are the building blocks of the civilizational structures. Um, and there are some indications that uh, the new physics might be just that. So if we go, oops. If uh, I also try to ex just quickly, um, I don't know why my presentation is now not. Okay, sorry about this. Um, what is the change that we are also envisioning part, as part of that? I'm not gonna read all of this, but it's certainly everything that is goes very hierarchical, very dominating, very uh, exclusive. Uh, and you see that these powers are, are being seriously challenged and they're trying to prove their existence today very strongly all over the world into much more inclusive, connected network-based structures where really we can use uh, potentials of everyone and uh, for a common joint uh, future. The model of eco-civilization that is uh, emerged at the beginning, uh, it still holds. We are now with our discussions, walking through the, uh, this model and trying to get the essence uh, on different levels, basically five key entities with joint goals. And today we are zooming in into the society where we will look from a global perspective, from a top-down perspective, what kind of role the this, this society can play in the future eco-civilization. Um, I'm not going to go much deeper into that because we have some really excellent speakers who will help us to explore this top-down approach, um, which uh, will show us what do we know today? How can we imagine with the knowledge that we have today uh, from two change makers on a global scale, uh, Ladea and Einar, they're both change makers in a top-down approach, dealing with the most pressing issues that we, uh, we're faced with today. Uh, and both of them uh, see uh, nature as an important uh, player and something that we have the responsibility to fully include, preserve, and jointly uh, develop also for our future generations. So with this uh, introduction, I would like to now uh, turn to our guests. And uh, as we agreed in our uh, brief session before this, uh, I will start with Einar. And uh, what attracted uh, the way how he attracted my attention, and I'm really happy, I know that you responded to the invitation, of course, um, with the help of Ladea, uh, is uh, your concept of a um, 
so-called natural state. And um, during our discussion, when I asked you, uh, is there already a global society emerging? You said, unfortunately, there is no global society, but, so please explain us your but, and how do you see this uh, new world emerging? And is there hope for eco-civilization or something similar to emerge, um, maybe even in our lifetime? I know the word is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Violetta, for a very nice introduction and for the invitation and for the um, introduction to um, eco-civilization and, and, and the topics. Uh, <clears throat> you're hearing me fine. Everything is, uh, is good. Um, very good. I'm going to try to share my screen uh, and answer your question. Uh, is there hope? Is there anything that we um, see working uh, globally? Uh, uh, in the way we do that um, make us uh, believe that there is something tying us together. Uh, well, as I answered before, uh, yes, um, I, there is. Uh, we are uh, without doubt connected as humans uh, in a both um, a natural and intellectual way, uh, emotional and uh, uh, very many people also think spiritual uh, and I'm uh, one of those without uh, discussing that in any uh, close range that's um, um, there is I do believe that there is a collective awareness I do believe that there is awareness and I do believe that um, we uh, humans as individuals and the natural beings um, create new forms when we work together um, so I do very be much believe in the essence of uh, 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 <laughs> We come from nature, as you said. I believe that we need to reflect on our natural relation. The human's relations to nature is, is core to our future existence. Uh, the human's relations to each other in the society is core. Uh, the human's relations to themselves, their identity, their individual understanding, their inner life is essential. So I do believe that, that this is very strong. And the relations um, I watch and see as uh, also transactions or augmented value chains uh, in what I then describe as a, as, as a market sphere. Uh, so I say that there is four elements or spheres. It's the market sphere that ties everything together uh, in a, both a global, local, a regional perspective. Uh, and it ties together all the transactions in the relations and the networks between nature, man, humans, and nature in collectively in societies. So that's the core essence of how I see this connected. And the only global perspective so far is the market itself. We, we are connected in the market. There is no global society. The UN is, is the closest we come kind of to a, a unanimous agreement, but it's also weak. Um, there is of course strength in, in weak ties, but, but it is a um, plurality of societies. It is regions, it's, it's structures, it's, uh, but, but the strongest connective factor is trade and um, the ties of the market, which has kind of, kind of uh, covered the whole planet. Uh, of course, we have uh, other uh, elements, the, the language of emotions, music, which is quite strong, uh, very important and, and um, uh, uh, also kind of, we have a mutual understanding of physics and the laws of nature. So it's, it's nature uh, and the market kind of tying us together, but there is no world order. It's, it is um, up to the market to understand, to, to be formed. But then um, I look at the market as a um, neutral structure that you can approach with the strength of an ID. And the market ideology of the 19th century was formed uh, by two main categories, capitalism and communism. And that is the last century market ideology. And it's how you trans, uh, for how you create value and how you distribute value. So that's the whole core and essence of, of, of my perspective is that you can choose uh, how you create value. And you can have an understanding that you can approach the market in any way because it's how you create value and how you share and distribute value in the market that defines 
how you how that value is kind of created. And this is why I'm talking so much to Ledea about circular approach. It's a principle. It's an ideal of uh, value creation, uh, sharing economies, all these economies. So that's the core of the new natural state of the market, where you look at regenerative and augmented value chains, where you look at value um, as something much more than just the income streams. And uh, we are working with a new spheric economic language for involvement of new and urban economy. So I'm going to run you very, very quickly through this because there is strong connection. So I come, I come from uh, uh, building communities and communities in this, this is what ties us together. So you have different communities. It's a plural of communities, it's many communities and they're starting to talk together. And I went, my school in market economics um, was in the coffee community where we worked with global value chains uh, all over the world, connecting natural resource into city markets in the Nordics. And that's my travel from Oslo. And that's, um, and that's the concept I took to Japan where I learned the market culture of Japan. And this is how I understood that the market culture of the Nordics is so different than the market culture of Japan. It, is, has, it has so many different references. What was interesting about the Japanese approach was that it's, um, has a really strong connection to nature. It's the Shinto-based culture that has formed what they evaluate. So what you evaluate defines how your economy is formed and how your market is formed. So you create a market culture. And this is uh, kind of, uh, for a long time, I thought that the market was kind of uh, the liberal, neoliberal market. It was one rule, but there isn't any rule. You can, you can approach how you do this in yourself. And in the Nordic, Nordic market culture, you have a very strong societal sphere. It's human oriented and it's, it's, it's very well balanced between private and, and public value creation. So it's, it's an enormous amount of understanding that this is representing completely different market approaches. And I've been working with economy and econ economy as language on what kind of structure you, you use uh, classically, but also now working with the culture behavior in the market and the culture economy, kind of the culture languages. And we see that the stories of a nation, the stories of anything, the structures, the resource management, the contextual value, all of this forms completely into different structures. And I was, I was so lucky to be hired by um, the city of Oslo to write the Oslo identity strategy, the, the, the brand strategy, because I was working as a brand strategist and economist and, and founder. And I'm looking at the value of identity. And this is where we, to find a brand new way of defining value for a city. And we said that it's the emotional values that count. So we said that the, the values of Oslo is being working in a genuine and a real way, searching for enrichment of all the, the kind of values first, the human value, the natural value, the societal value and the market's value is to be enriched at the same time. That's when you have a positive structure and then working in pioneering. So we dived into the emotional sphere, another societal sphere and the emotional values, value picture. And on this, I've formed several proof of concepts. I've developed maybe 25 concepts where we've been looking at the value creation first and income streams after in a value on oriented um, business modeling in a new and aware market because the market in Norway and Nordics are very aware. We're very well informed, we're super digitalized and uh, the approach of sustainability the last five years has been core and it's been actually uh, it's incremented in business modeling. So taking the value of nature into all kinds of projects has been core for, for us. And looking lately now after COVID, we developed a business model for building communities because we see that it's, it's in the communities that this happened. So we wanna make interlinks in both local, uh, global communities, all kinds of communities. So this is all examples. This is just uh, examples that I'm gonna run through because I'm gonna go over to the core essentials of this structure. So this is all proof of concepts where we've been looking at um, augmented holistic value spheres. And this is the sense when you look at the nature, human and society, and you look at the natural neutral um, connectivities in the market, you start getting a very strong factor. And this is why we're now engaged in the Nordic circular hotspot, developing a Nordic circular parallel market. So I'm just going to go to, to, this, to the core value. So what is the true value of a city, the sum of its city life? The, what is the identity of a city, the identity of city life? And what is the feel of a city, the feel of its city life? So the emotional value set is core and then content is key. So how we develop content in the aware market where everybody is now aware of environmental impact, 
We have the COVID changing the whole scene, understanding the community's necessity, and we have the understanding of deep division in the hum uh, human communities and the societies and unequalness. In this picture, uh, I do believe that sustainability over time will replace growth as the market driver in the world because we understand collectively in the collective awareness that we have to move this forward. And I do be believe, and I've been believing for many years, that collaboration ability is re replacing competition force as a driver. The world is now so completely changed from the old understanding of the market. It's digitalized, urbanized, and globalized. 100 years of globalization, 50 years of urbanization, and 20, 30 years of digitalization. And the market is now aware. It's, we're, we're sensing it, and we are understanding that the market itself is reacting uh, towards non-sustainable and sustainable structures. This is still lagging, but, but the market ideology of the 19th century, which we were stuck with in the 90s, neoliberalism or capitalism, is dated. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, resonate with, with a deep understanding of sustainable value creation over time. And it's changing the factor completely. So we're now looking at a completely different value set, driven by, of course, the UN, which is the closest to societal, uh, the SDGs, we're looking at several economic languages describing this, and this is the core. We're now looking at the plural economic languages of sharing economy, circular economy, which Lelea represents, which I think is the core economy for understanding natural resource. Donut economies emerging, urban economies, eco-economies, carbon economies. Where I come from with coffee, we developed transparency trade and we developed direct trade, solid direct value chains where we took away all exploit structures. So if we managed to manipulate and create a new approach to the market itself, which is neutral and natural, we will create this structure in a complete new way. So this is the neutral and natural balance and sustainable state of, of a market sphere or urban market sphere, market sphere. It is the sum of all transaction connections and effects of value creation in the dense value sphere that you're looking. And you're looking at the transactional structure. So there's four factors or four elements, but one is neutral and that is the market. And if we can say that, you know, you don't need to exploit everything. You can be sustainable over time. You can be regenerative in your value chains. You can work circular. You can work with sharing. You can work with value optimization. You can nurture safety from societal perspective to ensure individual freedom and, and, and the inner life of any human. You can work in this factor if you manage to show the valuation. It's all kinds of, and you need to increase the value perspective. So in the societal value sphere, you have innovation value, collaboration value, learning value as key values. Uh, natural value is of course, circular value, is environmental value, contextual value, where are you? These descriptions are important because they all participate in the one sense that I see working in Japan, the Nordics, US, uh, working in uh, Milan, uh, London, I've been working all over the world in different market cultures. The core essence to humans, the most important value for a human being is its own identity. It's the, how you feel about yourself and your perspective is always unique. The market is 8 billion people taking emotional choices, how we identify things from ourselves, that creates real relations value and that is based on emotional value. And the market in the world today is, is and it's proven in COVID, is quite fragile. The, the most important value for future value, um, um, yeah, value for future value creation is trust. It's an emotion. So it really shows the fragileness of this. And it's about um, kind of awakening people and saying that it's your choices, 100%. It's, 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 uh, it's how you create value that defines how you, um, uh, if you're in a sustainable mode or not. And if you are able to see the natural value, the societal value and the human value at the same time, that's when you create the right type of value. And and can I just jump in there for a second? Because I'd like to, uh, one question, I'd like to give it to you. So uh, if, if it's possible, sorry. Um, you talk about this own identity, which is very individual. You talk about different cultural frameworks that define the way how trade is going. So seeing all these project, all projects all over the world, do you sense that something on a global scale is emerging as a global awareness, global consciousness? Would you be yes. able to bring this individual identity and trust, which is so individual really, uh, into a broader global awareness and global consciousness? Can you see the traces? Yes, this is how we disrupted the coffee industry in the 20s, in the early 2000s. 
through digitalization and through the connectivity of the digital world, the digital parallel market and, and, and the communication, we are now creating and augmenting a global awareness of our connectivity. Transparency brings trust. Total transparency gives trust. Total trust is a theory. When we are starting to get transparency into all value chain and everybody understands impact value of anything that you work with, you're starting to get this. So, the, so this is why I'm saying that after 100 years of globalization, 50 years of urbanization and 30 years of digitalization, the market is now global. There is no rule, there is no set of engagement, it's the emotional structure and understanding of how things are connected. And this awareness is settling down in the generation that is coming. Well, that's my hope. You talk, said, uh, and that's where we have to go. We have to understand uh, the, the force of the collective digital enabled awareness that we're getting, the insight, WikiLeaks, everything is being exposed, everything is being transparent and structured. And in that wake, that's gonna be the next 10, 20, 20, 40 years, that is gonna be stronger. And we have to hope that it's gonna be a tipping point where that is actually, uh, people are starting to take collectively conscious choices in a much bigger scale than ever done. But the thing is, this is, this is being expected. So the market participants are now changing. They're changing their mis business model because they think that what they did before that was uh, possible because of uh, ignorance or um, uh, able to hide stuff is gonna be exposed. So the transparency threat to negative value chain structuring is so big for any corporate that they are starting to change their business models. And this is why I'm saying that the market itself is now gliding into a new natural state. And that's my hope um, be because it's driven by the understanding that nature has own value and we are deeply connected to nature. We are natural beings. We forgot it for maybe 50 years. All the thinkers of the 19th century were, were very concerned about the transaction of man toward exploitation of man. But man's exploitation of nature was never put into the equation because it was finite. Mm. Mm. And that's, mm. that's the big problem, right? We've been, all the theory, all the philosophy, all the economic models have been thinking, how do you uh, exchange uh, value between people and not between people and humans and nature? Because that's taken for granted. It's always there. It's not anymore. That awareness will shake the grounds and it is shaking the grounds of everything. Material scarcenessness. This is why circular economy is so important because it really re resonates with with the natural resource. So this is this is this is the consciousness around sustainability. Collaboration uh, replaces competition force. This is in Norwegian because I'm a bit further now. So digital disruption and physical flexibility, globalization and urbanization, sharing and resource optimization, the human resource and natural becomes valuable. It's the, in the dynamics you create value. Society and market, local and global, urban and rural, digital and physical, and the balance between man and nature. That's core. And understanding that, that that's, and, and that's all as well. It's in the dynamics, you create the value. Thank you very much. I think this was very clear, straight to the point. And um, I could just pull everything that you just shared with us into the core understanding of eco-civilization. Uh, I know this was, um, for me, very, very uh, important. Uh, clarification of some terms. And I think we could uh, further discuss now the importance of transparency, the importance of uh, really uh, collective uh, conscious decision makings uh, and understanding of our uh, dependencies, uh, which of course uh, can come through only when we deal in a transparent world. So uh, we'll get back gave us a good line to move to our next uh, speaker, Ladea, uh, where you, when you mentioned circular economy. And uh, I'd like to uh, explore a little bit further uh, uh, the concept as, uh, of circular economy as a tool, as Ladea calls it. Um, is, uh, and I'd like to get your inputs, Ladea, from working in different cultural setups, but all the time in, in the international arena, uh, can you see circular economy be one of the platforms for um, for this sort of development of a global uh, consciousness and uh, also to be a tool which contributes to this higher level of transparency 
um, and of course uh, brings people together uh, under the global shared vision and global shared value uh, set. Madea, yeah. what okay. is your so first of all, uh, thank you for inviting me and it is always great uh, hearing all these different ideas and I know Einar and his concept and I'm really <laughs> in a fan club of that. So yes, regarding circular economy, of course, uh, as you said, uh, I see it as a tool, but uh, what I think is really important that uh, we take it as such and uh, we discussed already prior to this uh, opening about uh, the importance of seeing the whole journey you know, that we don't uh, have to have the final answers or because uh, even our knowledge is still limited and understanding of connections is limited. And if we are going to neuroscience, uh, how much brain do we use? And if we go further on to spirituality, uh, how little we know. So yes, uh, from, from one perspective, this is good that we have this tool and that it is uh, enabling us to collaborate in a different way and to, to, to co-create new solutions, but it is only a tool on this journey. So uh, I'm more on the side of exploring and opening things than to uh, getting stick to the um, existing definitions or models, because as soon as we start doing that, we are locked in the existing mindset. So it's of crucial importance, I think, that we are opening our mindset and allowing different kinds of uh, thinking. Yeah. So uh, and what I would like to, to say is when I was observing also the list of participants now, I think that uh, this is a great example of that, what global community actually is. So no matter whether the, the number is high uh, or uh, it, if it is a classroom or whatever, uh, and uh, what, what brought us together our shared values. So that is why we are here. And this is already the, uh, as Einar nicely explained, a kind of an entry point towards this new society or eco-civilization or however we call it. And another thing that I always emphasize that is very personal is that I believe in synchro destiny. From everyone uh, around this circle today, uh, I have a story because most of you I know and I'm deeply grateful for everyone. And I really believe that uh, the fact that we met uh, already contributed uh, to the better. So if we were uh, able to understand what each of us is bringing to the table. So th this is my biggest gratefulness. And really um, here I see also the essence of this new society and this new community, you know. Uh, once, uh, once you are transparent towards yourself as well and uh, ready to embrace what different people are bringing to you, it helps uh, walking on this journey. And uh, again, uh, what we need is inspiration. And I'm sure that through the presentations and uh, the talk today, we will find out that we are inspired by very similar people, things, uh, culture, you know. Uh, so this is already something what, what is our common denominator. Uh, and uh, maybe we do not um, give enough attention to these things and uh, we give too much attention to something that is more tangible. But at the end, to build a society and community, uh, at least from my perspective, this is what counts. And this social capital is what can uh, lead us forward. So uh, if you have any question here, Rilita, otherwise I would uh, go Okay, so I just prepared a few slides um, because it is good to understand uh, what, what we are talking about. And I um, took uh, one quote that I like very much, that uh, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. <laughs> and it is hard sometimes. Uh, because even in my life, when, sometimes I say, oh, why do I need this? Or why, why these things are happening to me? But when you look back, then you understand that it was uh, really important that certain things happened, that you met certain people, that you were engaged in certain situations. So, and I think that we are now in this kind of turning point also as a civilization, that we, we cannot understand what is happening and we cannot embrace everything uh, because it is not nice and it's not easy to handle. But once we will take a look backwards, we will understand that maybe that was uh, really good for us. And the other question is, how to be, do we behave when we are scared to death? 
And that is what is happening today. So I switched off the media. I don't know whether I'm allowed to go out or not because I cannot uh, be scared all the time. And uh, this brings also uh, the sense of insecurity. So we feel unsecured, unequipped to live our own lives. Uh, then we are isolated and yes, don't go, don't meet, you know, and all that affects us. So then this uh, feeling of loneliness and be being alone is different than being lonely. And then we are confused because we don't know what to believe, what not to believe, what the numbers are saying and what they're not. And then we start accusing others, you know, and this is really not the right way forward. But this is what uh, the media and uh, the social media as well is now uh, performing. So, so this is where we stand. And uh, what, what I see as a bright side of that, that maybe out of that, uh, this situation, we, we are putting now health before wealth. What means that also now, if I go to the green recovery and all the funds that are available, this health, I don't mean only the COVID situation, but the health of people, of uh, society as in general. So here I see a little bit of hope, but as I said, it is hard uh, to keep uh, this uh, momentum and to, to be inspired if you are not equipped with, with something, what I would say, a, a kind of inner compass or inner peace. So you need a very strong um, relation with your core or with the source, however we call it. Otherwise, uh, you become really uh, contraproductive and maybe even uh, arrogant, aggressive and everything what comes out of that. And another uh, point that is interesting, and I like this part of the crisis, is the mystification of our vulnerability and mortality. Particularly for Western society, being old, being sick, uh, uh, being, uh, I don't know, uh, not capable of doing something, uh, and uh, facing that we will all die one day, it was so detached from our daily life and from our culture that I think that it is causing a problem as well, you know? I just talked to my friends in Japan and it is nice that we have here this Japanese, <laughs> small Japanese club with uh, Einer and I saw Vesna as well. And they said uh, that they're facing uh, different, uh, not a different situation, but that there are not so, uh, so many tests uh, are not done uh, for COVID, for example, and that they faced a kind of a little bit higher fever and things like that, but they're somehow living with that. And they can also uh, embrace being sick or <laughs> embracing, yes, one day we all have to die in a very different manner than we do. So, so this is also interesting. And I think that this is something what we should uh, uh, really talk more about because you cannot prevent the death. And what we are now uh, talking about is, uh -huh, if we take all these restrictions, then we will live forever, but it's not true. <laughs> So, so this is also something what I think it's good uh, talking about. Uh, then what Einer already said, yes, through the markets and everything, we are more interdependent and interconnected than ever uh, before because of the globalization and everything. And here uh, is just one uh, slide showing that circularity is also a way to achieve sustainable consumption and production. And of course, other uh, SDGs that are very much linked to that. But when we are addressing this topic, it is again funny in a way, because it is uh -huh, uh, sustainable uh, production and consumption. What does it mean? So, uh, but we have to work on our GDPs and we have to work on the growth. So there is again this shift in how to organize our economy and society to live a quality life. That is the question at the end of the day. And GDP is, yes, something what we have invented and the measurement, but it is much more than that that we have to address. So this is also something interesting. And as I said, yes, we are, we are sharing similar sources. As you said, Violeta, uh, with John Lennon at the beginning, uh, I, like, uh, I like his piece as everyone uh, most likely uh, is in favor of his songs and everything, but his messages and this imagine, this word imagine that you're using Violeta very often as well, uh, this is something what even uh, in the educational system and again in the Western society mm, was not very much supported, you know, uh, because it was, uh -huh, you imagine you are a dreamer. And being a dreamer was not something what uh, would be wanted. 
and how to preserve uh, this, uh, you know, this our this inner, um, yeah, uh, we, we have this potential and that is what we are. We are the dreamers and we have the capability to imagine. But once we forget how to imagine, then we cannot achieve anything because then we are trapped into that uh, existing mindset and so on. So I think that now we really have to imagine a lot. And also this is what leads innovation forward. Without imagination, we cannot. And another tool that um, is here and has been here since ever is the storytelling. And um, storytelling is, uh, it, it is now interesting uh, because we have all the social media and everything. So, but still the way how we share messages uh, and what you are doing with eco-civilization, you're telling a story. You're opening the playground where different actors can come and jointly create this story. And if we go to the structure of the storytelling, there is everything what we need also to imagine this future uh, society or this uh, future civilization. So um, it was, uh, therefore, I used that other uh, photo. So already when people were living in the caves, they were using stories and they need, uh, they wanted to express something by carving uh, on the stones. And today we want to express that as well. And uh, when we are in this hour, let's, I mean, I think that I'm in this circular bubble, but within this circular bubble, we talk a lot about this new narrative, about how to deliver messages. And I'm very um, happy because I see that even the, uh, the most uh, conventional reports made by European institutions are becoming more based on the storytelling. So there is a hope, but it is good to keep in mind that this is something that is driving us. And uh, before I conclude, yes, what I believe in is that every life has a purpose. So everyone matters. Uh, and uh, this is one book that I'm reading right now. So Everyday Ubuntu, and I will go to another slide afterwards uh, because we have someone who knows a lot about that. Uh, but Maybe Ladea, since you just made this opening, I can jump in and just yeah. tell the audience because in a couple of weeks time, we will be discussing individuals and the role of individuals in the um, eco-civilization. And of course, we will touch uh, with yeah. the help of Sonia and uh, some other actors. Also, one of the dimensions uh, that we, uh, it's part uh, of the model uh, on the being side is Ubuntu. Yeah. Uh, and, and that uh, it's becoming a very powerful message mm -hmm. emerging uh, from Africa and yeah. a gift to the global community. Thanks. That is, you know, because uh, what is the society? The society is the sum of individuals. So as long as each individual does not feel that he or she has a purpose and cannot live a purposeful life, we as a society cannot thrive. Because th then you have all the frustrations and everything. What do you have to solve on this journey and cannot really collaborate? And here I come to what I wanted to mention, how things are uh, connected and uh, how this development, uh, this is very subjective, of course, what I have choose here, but uh, for those who do not know, with Velita, we were together uh, running the Institute for uh, Business Growth and Creativity many years ago. <laughs> it was too early. And at that time uh, we were introducing this uh, concept of uh, INCO, so innovative communication. And uh, Violeta wrote a book, Rhythms of Business Evolution, based on that. So th there was already the essence of the model we are discussing today. And then uh, uh, we have Sonia, who so nicely put it together, different, uh, different concepts, angles, including uh, Ubuntu in uh, her IEOU leadership book. So another, um, I would say, very valuable resource for inspiration. And uh, with Aina, we are working now on this uh, together on this uh, Kyoto Manifesto book uh, that is going to be published next year. So wh why I picked this? Because we can see that everything has a purpose. That what I opened my discussion uh, with. So when we look backwards, we understand why we did something. When we were working on this manifesto in 2008, Everyone thought we are crazy, but we, I think that we are not, and we were not. Uh, but that is why it's hard to be a pioneer sometimes. So the journey continues, and uh, I'm really happy when I see these different models approaches popping up. Uh, here I'm, uh, I put it to one uh, based on Violeta model and the other one on Petra Kunkel. 
uh, who is also a part of this uh, Kyoto journey. Uh, she is a German lady uh, who is also in the board of Club of Rome. And she created also a very interesting model of collective leadership for sustainability uh, and this compass. And if you think, uh, if you take a look at these concepts, they resonate because they have the same uh, message or the same purpose. So therefore, I think it's so important and on different places, different models are appearing because this is the journey and whatever helps us on this journey uh, is really useful. So I will conclude just briefly with uh, our journey of the circular change. In these times, we call it uh, that we are circular change for circular chance because now there is a chance to do something and I have been already introduced. So I will not go into the details. I will just expose what Yuri mentioned at the beginning, uh, the European Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform, why? Because uh, the ambition of this platform in Brussels is really to become the network of networks regarding not only circular economy, but more, uh, as we said, this is the definition is the circular economy, but it is uh, the platform where we can share knowledge and find partners and so on. So another tool uh, for that, and what I like very much is that we can collaborate on different parts of the globe now, unfortunately, only through these screens. Uh, but it is so nice when you see uh, how people, let's say in Western Balkans or Latin America, Israel, Japan, you know, really share values. So uh, when we are coming back now to this uh, umbrella, what you said at the beginning, so what, what is this glue of the society? Definitely the values are shared. How we express them in our daily life, uh, this is different in different cultures. But whenever you dig, you come to the same things. So deep in ourselves, we are very similar, no matter on uh, which part of this planet we live. So that was uh, in a nutshell for uh, the beginning. And I'm looking forward now to our conversation. Oof. Thank you very much, Ladaya. Always a very unique and innovative angle. But uh, let me just uh, dare to summarize a little bit what um, I got out of it for um, better understanding of how community can uh, evolve and what are the emerging uh, elements that we are becoming more and more aware of. So I've heard that uh, storytelling is an important element, imagining is an important element, and then uh, uh, construct networks that uh, could uh, infuse the um, cooperation on a global scale, which you gave us many examples uh, showing that this is actually happening. And if I connect that back with the uh, Einer's uh, proposal for transparency, uh, we, and, and, and a sort of value essence of having a common value, which both of you so nicely uh, presented. Uh, I feel that we are part of this fresh new global emergence. I mean, it might be uh, green, it might be trans, uh, transparent, it might be uh, on, based on a shared economical value and dependencies. But something is emerging. Uh, I mean, I can feel it. I'm, I'm getting very excited. And we've got so many different um, elements that are showing uh, how this emergence is taking place. And thank you to both of you. We saw that there are many different perspectives that need to be monitored. It's not going to happen because of one element. But all of a sudden, so many different things are either we are remembering them because they are centuries old, or we are bringing them forward as our new value creation uh, from, uh, from this civilization that we are part of. So I cannot then avoid a question to both of you. And uh, I'd be very happy to uh, hear also um, friends from the audience. Uh, so just indicate if somebody wants to raise a question. But uh, I will uh, ask for um, right to go with one more question first. Uh, Whenever we are, whatever we do, decision making is an essential element of uh, moving forward. So, could you share a little bit how you imagine and how you, are you experiencing in these new structures that you are part of really the decision making? 
is it changing? What are the essence of decision-making? For example, uh, Erner, in your concept of a natural state or uh, Ladea in uh, your emerging network of networks, what are the essential elements? Is this a challenge or it comes naturally? Maybe Einer will bring you back first. Well, it's always a challenge taking the right decision, but um, uh, to bring clarity to the kind of uh, um, decision-making process is a quite simple question. Um, does it feel right? uh in the very end um that's 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 the core of what we need to establish uh do you does it feel uh, fundamentally right uh to say yes or to say no to any choice uh to uh, understand any kind of direction that change forces you and that's my whole kind of um understanding working in so many different cultures, working with the global perspective in these different communities, uh, forming, we kind of define the values of where we um, uh, take decision on. That's a value compass. That's a value filter. That's what we, what we established for Oslo uh, to define how to take decisions on what feels right to tell the story of Oslo, what kind of project we made it a value filter to actually help taking decisions in the right directions and that's uh, that's the core essence of everything uh, is so there any special tool Einar, that you use when you bring all these different cultures together uh, because of course each of cultures has a specific way of decision making as well have you not bring together that you decide together um, in, on a certain uh, measure, on the next steps. Yeah. Well, uh, this is the, uh, the fundamental. Uh, we need to. Uh, you need to always to try to look for the value perspective of anything, and you need to also understand that culturally that is different. Um, and it's uh, and that is where I feel that the community of the globe or the global community uh, can kind of hack the market and then start uh, using that um, transactional structure. Uh, with emotional value perspectives of what feels right with awareness because awareness gives insight that gives emotional understanding of what is right and wrong in decision making and it's very interesting that's why t people from different places of the world historically have taken different uh, decisions and, and evaluated different things but now we are globalized we are in the global structure we are now starting and this is why I think people will start to emotionally choose what they understand and know and feel is the most sustainable uh, solution in the future. That's my hope, that's my goal, that the global community and the market community or within any market segment, the circular community, that's what we push forward to bring awareness, so much awareness that people start taking the emotional correct choice in what that, because sustainability becomes a value. It becomes, becomes a quality of what you want to uh, preserve. Uh, and that's how the market starts changing. And the society starts changing and the human starts changing. And that's how we also in the fundamental essence change the direction of the nature itself from a destructive way to a kind of regenerative way. So it is very important, the decision. It's a very good question. Thank you very much. Uh, Ladea, what's your experience? How do you manage networks of networks? How the decisions are made? And do you feel similar uh, emergence of similar like, qualities and elements? Yeah, I, I like this definition that it is very easy, as I said. Uh, so what does feel right? But what I see is still very much present that, on, uh, that we have two kinds of decision making. So one is personal decision making. I want everything best for my kids. So when I'm deciding in my microcosmos, I will decide what I feel is good. But then when I'm on the corporate level, or you know Violeta Brussels structures very well, uh, then all of a sudden we have this corporate hat, uh, or I don't know, the hat of a leader, and we start, uh, start taking decisions that are not good for everyone and with which we do not personally feel well, 
but we hide behind the system or behind the corporation saying, oh, you know, this is good for business or this is good for I don't know what. So I think this is the same as with ethics. You cannot have personal ethics and business ethics. The same is with decision making. So if you would like to take right decisions, take right decisions always, not when you are a mother, you take right decision. When you are a CEO, you take wrong decision. So I think that this is still uh, not um, totally balanced, you know, or that people did, did not, uh, I don't know what all the reasons are, but that is what I'm facing. And on the other hand, I think that uh, decision-making uh, I will go back to my slide that I have shown is something when you say yes, to something, you say no to something else. So again, to the Western culture, we think we should have everything at once now here. No, it does not go. So uh, the decision making is also whenever I say yes, I say no to something, and it is good to know that. And then, then the decision making as such is, uh, is a different process, you know, and we should not deny that. So I think that these are maybe two aspects that we should take in account. Could you, uh, but could you share with us, uh, for example, when you work, um, when you make a decisions on, a, let's say, Chile, when you introduce mm -hmm. uh, a compass for uh, circular economy, is there anything specific, any tool that helps you when you are in a different cultural framework uh, to bring decisions together? Yeah, I, I will compare Chile and Japan, for example. Uh, when I was in Japan uh, last year, spending time with professors and others. So uh, it was, you know, this is very hierarchical uh, society. So you're not even allowed to introduce yourself if the one who is uh, above you is not introducing yourself. Vista can share her experiences as well later on. So uh, first uh, I thought, oh, it is really ridiculous in a way, you know, because it is not democratic and whatever. But then, then, then you accept that and you, you find the reason in that as well. But um, what, what uh, was nice part of decision making there was that when we started to work together on the concept of the book, uh, I was taking notes, what I always do, you know, I always have this and I'm taking notes and I was the only one taking notes. And then uh, they were looking at me, but not asking anything because you're not allowed to ask. And then uh, in the second session, I ask, oh, do you maybe have a flip chart? Because I, I, I will just draw it for myself because you cannot be uh, too, uh, too proactive and offer something to others and so on and so on. So in the process of one month time, what happened is that when I was leaving, uh, the, the editor of the book, the professor, distinguished professor, he said, oh, can I take copies of your notebook, because this is the most valuable resource we have. And next time when you come, uh, can you teach us how to collaborate in this way? You know, so for me, it was very strong message. Uh, so I did respect their culture. I did respect their um, uh, hierarchy, but I was uh, still authentic. So I, I didn't want to change anyone, but I stick to my habits and I thought, okay, if this helps me, maybe. So, but this is how so you created a bridge, really. Yeah, but not by preaching or by pushing or you know. But th that is that was one lesson for us by being, by being who by you being. are. Yes, with yeah. Japan. And on the other hand, we've got now discussion uh, regarding Chile. You know, the day, uh, mining is a very strong industry or sector in Chile, and now you have circular economy, sustainability, and mining. And they asked me, oh, how can we put now these different stakeholders together, the NGO and the owner of the mining, you know? And I said, yeah, just by simply allowing them to put their interests on the table without judging anything. Because at the end of the day, you cannot close this mining tomorrow, but the, the purpose or the, uh, also the proposals from NGOs might help them to find a solution to transform this mining into something else, you know? These are very simple things. But at the end, it, 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 and they were, when they reported back, they said, oh, this was so nice because the person from NGO was not aggressive at all. And they, you know, the dialogue happened. I was not there at all. I, I just proposed something what is obvious and very simple, uh, but allowing people to have their own interests as well. So it is okay. You know, so here I see that when we are building these communities and when we are trying to, to nourish the dialogue, we really have uh, not to be generous, but to be humble, 
you know so i don't have the answers you are right i'm right so the, this culture is essential for for building bridges and for co-creating solutions and so this is how i see that society can be prosperous society thank you very much basically participatory uh, engage people bring them on board let them be heard and then collectively make uh, common understandings of the learnings uh, of the community and move forward. I'd like to uh, share with you one of the questions, uh, which is um, from Dimitri. He, uh, for some technical reasons, cannot raise it himself. And it's for both of you. Uh, I was, and I'm speaking now for him. I was thinking about uh, this uh, from a different perspective about tools for collaboration. For example, we know in chemistry, there are catalysts that increase the speed of interaction between elements. Is this situation possible in circular economy use, to use some catalysts so we could be able to implement changes faster? Then that question would apply to both of you. Can you see the, uh, Einer, the proliferation of your ideas uh, through catalysts. And Ladea, do you use the circular economy catalysts and uh, does it work? Einer? Um, I can try to answer the catalyst factor is, uh, for us, um, uh, it's about creating this uh, mutual understanding of where we're going at the very early stage. So we're, we're back to mutual values in the group and the community. And just to, to refer to the decision-making uh, processes that we do in our, uh, when we advise on big scale production st structures, like now we work with a combined uh, group effort on circular transition of the Nordics, where we are looking at all catalyzing uh, structures in the Nordics, uh, but we're also doing um, a group uh, or community decision-making because we wanna have a egalitarian and flat structured, and we wanna have involvement and participation in the process, so we have engaged everybody. Um, then we do strategic processes um, where we go in uh, and, and uh, exactly a bit like um, Ladea is explaining as well with the process, also I'm working that way in Japan, where you go in as a facilitator and you, you allow a full open transparent process uh, of participation and discussion uh, on key uh, values in the beginning. What do we share? And we, we try to always find out what is the shared values and what is the opposing values. And then we say, well, we have shared values here. So we're gonna focus on that. And then you just really kickstart any process because then everybody works in the same direction and we accept differences. We accept um, uh, that things are different, uh, but we expect that process over time will align and make mutual understanding of maybe differences. And we see this in, I've been working with city development for big groups to work together for creating city life, sustainable city life in a small scale city, having both public sphere owners of lands and, and uh, business owners, everybody with different perspectives. But you get them to start collaborating on mutual projects, mutual values, mutual um, uh, structures in this process. And then after a bit of time, they have gone, got alignment. So the alignment structuring processes is key to kickstart because in any, this is, I, I'm not sure if you're referring to cash and exchange capacity with fulvic acids where you, where you really uh, aggravate uh, energy uh, transactions in, in physical uh, or chemical structures. Uh, it's, 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 it is a bit of the same because you, you get just so many collaborative factors in, uh, you overshadow the differences and you, um, uh, and you can approach the differences later and they just have changed perspective completely and they find the solution together. So it's, it's kind of this group management strategic process which we are doing in, in all our community establishment. We, we, we are building communities for movement of change. And then you really need to be agree of, of your mutuals and you need to uh, find that very, very early in the state. Right, Ladaya? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I think that th this is very good point, actually, this catalyst, because um, when, when we are, uh, we often have these discussions, you know, uh, we have these existing stu structures now, and yeah, we see that the systems are collapsing, health system is collapsing, <laughs> education system is collapsing in a way now. 
but I see this catalyst as something what is growing at the same time at different parts of the globe. And once it gets connected, you know, it is so powerful uh, that uh, no revolution is needed, that this will be a kind of evolution when all these uh, lighthouses uh, or however we call them uh, come together. Uh, th this is my hope, at least, or my dream, uh, that once they are empowered and connected, uh, then we have actually this eco-civilization, you know. And are you trying to identify, Ladea, when you work in these different cultural environments, are you trying to identify these catalysts that then somehow uh, yeah. create some sort of sub-networks? Or is this really just let... Uh, no, uh, uh, in my work, I must say that I'm doing this uh, purposeful and <laughs> I'm very sensitive for that and trying to find them, first to map them. And luckily uh, in the projects where I'm engaged, uh, always stakeholders mapping is a part of the tasks, luckily. So uh, first is to find them. Uh, you cannot find everyone, but you find one and this one has an, you know, the, how the system works. And it, it is already something if you find five of, 500. Uh, so, and then this is not enough, then we have to enable them. And that is what we are discussing now with Einar as well, uh, because uh, it is hard to, to you know, uh, to, to survive in a way if you are not then enabled and empowered and connected and uh, have access to resources. So uh, this is very important. Then once you find them, you enable them and connect them in a way that they get stronger and stronger. Okay, cool. I've, uh, I think we got a couple of very important elements out of this uh, question. First of all, um, catalysts are needed and catalysts uh, could even be sort of encouraged uh, to, to act as catalysts even stronger in, in certain communities. But um, I, we also heard that processes are very important. Einer shared with us not only participatory process, but also the strategic processes, alignment processes. Uh, in, in all of these situations, probably catalysts are emerging and they're probably leading the way that uh, this can come to the successful conclusion. So um, we're building more and more complex, but very understandable structure of the community uh, and elements that the community needs to have in order to live sustainably. I mean, uh, I keep putting these elements together, so I'm very curious what's going to merge at the end out. We have another question. Um, Raini would like to share it with us. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Violeta, for this opportunity. Can you hear me? Can, can you all hear me? Yeah. So my question yeah, to both panelists yes. is, so my question to both panelists is, as most of the markets feed on human egos. How do you see products or brands surviving in the society which is human-centric, not egocentric? Say, if I'm happy in a 3BHK, why would uh, I buy a big house? Because I'm happy in 3BHK. It is satisfying all my needs. And, but if I'm buying something big, it is maybe because of my status, because of my uh, you know identity in the society. So likewise, almost every product is feeding on human ego. How do you see in such scenario, economies surviving? Thank you very much. Please, uh, Einar, that was your topic more, value creation, go ahead. Oh, that's, a very, uh, that's a very essential question. Uh, what is driving the market today? And, and unfortunately, you're pinpointing this very well by saying that th that's the, the egocentric drive. That's what's kind of been the lecture of any growth paradigm. And, and this, uh, this uh, makes us question the essence of the growth paradigm in, it, in itself. Do we need to have um, human-driven, uh, mm. uh, egocentric growth to mm. uh, the materialism? And this is an offspring of the, I would say, the market ideal of the, from the 1950s. And especially it scales completely out of range up in the 1990s uh, with this... Um, Individual focus, and this this comes from from this comes from the global perspective of our economy being formed by the neoliberalism structure, where we have we have to have a lot of items to to yeah. to have a good life, 
the point is that we have to completely change our value perspective. We have to look to, for instance, Japan, where, where, where you have kind of natural moderation. You can, you can be, and that, that has something to do with uh, life perspective. This is, remember, this culture of market comes from a culture where we have a very short time perspective. Uh, we don't have the Asian perspective at all, where you have long time, long term perspectives. Uh, many many lives going past uh, you can you can do something for generations and and you can have a moderation in this life you have a completely other different cultural aspect of time and life uh, in culture right so this is why asian and uh, western european uh, economy is so different we we've been brought up to understand that this is a one go we have uh, we have to accumulate as much wealth as possible um, so it's really deeply rooted in uh, the last 500 years of economic development. So, so this problem with the egocentric market drive is extremely big. Uh, but this is the shift that we're seeing. Suddenly, if you create other values, service value, uh, experience value, if it's more valuable to walk in the forest than to buy a big television, you have a different value perspective. The revaluation of nature, natural experience, uh, local food, if you understand that uh, local production, local fashion, local is, has more value than big scale corporate uh, fashion brands, global structures. If you understand the actual dynamics of global local, if you understand, uh, if you reevaluate um, the societal uh, experiences, sharing, then, then you start switching. The perspectives are switching. And in the end, when we were doing, we were doing futuring for the Norwegian post office for their circular strategies. And, we, and I've been doing futuring for the city of Oslo and degrowth societies. So 1940s, 1950s societies um, for Bergen, the city of Bergen. Uh, how, 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 what, what has value in, in 2050s? What uh, is, is the perspective of value so different that we've been able to take switch direction? And this is why I'm hopeful, because I think we will. I think we collectively, because of these communities that are being established, because of the knowledge that is being uh, being delivered, we are going to start choosing on a different value perspective, a more uh, less egocentric, more social, more natural, uh, understanding these values uh, in a completely different way. And we see the science happening also in the fashion, in the branding. We see it in the big corporates, the giants. They understand that this is happening. So they're like going back. And this is where circular economy comes in with suddenly they want to have re reuse structure, refabricated. Ups you know, you're starting to evaluate stuff again, not for consume and throw away and just for display, but the long-term perspective is entering uh, the Western economies. This is present. I've, I've been in India for six months and traveling around. I love the Indian culture. I've, I've been working in Japan for the next, last 10 years uh, with the Japanese culture and perspective. And the difference is, and this is what I mean with market cultures, there's so different perspectives. Uh, and I think that what we've learned from the Western perspective that got to dominate the world, especially from the 90s and out, is just dated. It, it's, it's proven not sustainable and everybody's in the global community of sustainability is noticing this and this is spreading. I hope, and we have to help it spread. It's a communication thing, and uh, the whole thing, as, as Ladea also points out, it's so important. Thank you. To have this conversation. Thank you. Well, I have to ask uh, what, uh, because this is now evolving. Very interesting. Uh, one question, uh, both of you, uh, because you just mentioned that this Western and aggressive, dominating culture is uh, being seriously challenged by uh, by today's life and uh, the conditions under which we found ourselves. Uh, do you think democracy has hope? I mean, is democracy, which somehow was invented in this uh, atmosphere as well, uh, can we improve it or is it something else emerging um, that will be as a platform for people's decision-making in the future? Do you see anything either improving democracy or basically evolving as a replacement? Uh, Ladea, do you want to go first, or should I? Is that you? You just could conclude. I think it's good if you wrap it up, and then I will add. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm I'm a social democrat. I'm grown up in the Nordic market culture, where 
uh, democracy stands very strong. And it is, uh, it, uh, we have the most transparent market culture in the world. Uh, my salary is transparent. Everybody can, every, everybody can see everything. We have public salary lists. We have public accounting uh, uh, lists. Every company has revealed numbers. Everything is transparent. And it's quite interesting to come from that culture and think that this is how it is. And then, and then understand that this is not how it is at all. So this is the transparency aspect. So transparency is key to to. So, so, so I, I do think I do think social uh, social democracy is is very interesting to come from, and to see democracy challenged the way it is and has been. I'm very excited for the. Uh, but I th I think democracy will uh, survive. I think uh, the transparency structures that is digitalized will change it. There's different democracy in a local, global, regional, national perspective. But I think uh, I think democracy is our most neutral and uh, best way to manage public or societal sphere uh, in, in a good way. But the market isn't dem democratic. Uh, but that's why we need the strong democracies. This is a bit like Keynesism that formed the welfare systems in, in Europe in, in, uh, in, uh, right after the Second World War and was kind of the dominant economic uh, theory before neoliberalism came in, in, in the 70s and 60s where this full liberal market kind of uh, and the dismantling of the public sphere or the societal sphere. This hasn't happened in the Nordics the same way it's happened in Central Europe and, and especially in, in, the, in the US. And I think, so I think after COVID, I think democracies will be reinvented i think they will be restructured i'm really hopeful for the election in the us because it's kind of an identity culture still mm -hmm. a western structure i do think that the democracies will be kind of um, reinvented where sustainabilism or 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 uh, kind of uh, the the neutral the more neutral grounds maybe it will be more apoliticized uh, but and more like um, focused on actual sustainability sustainable uh, uh, societies, and that's the form, and 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 you can work freely around. But the mm. key, my experience, is that a democratic society gives truly individual freedom because you're safe. Yeah. You're not free without the feeling of safety, mm. and, and that is a, one of the core feelings that us humans need. Mm. We really feel free, and that's the whole strangeness and of safe, life. free and safe. Yeah. You're right. Yeah. So I think, and people will seek that, and democracies is the best option. And I think we will just make them better in the eco civilization community or in the future communities that's happening. Super. Uh, we'll go now to Ledea, hear her comment, and then uh, we're approaching the end of the session, actually. It went really fast. I just checked the clock. Uh, so I would ask both of you as well um, to or wrap up message. Uh, are we uh, emerging? Are we at the point of uh, entering the new civilization of paradigm or not? And um, what's your final message to us, to the group, and uh, to our future uh, engagements? But Ladea, first, the comment that you had ready for the previous okay. question. Just briefly, I will comment to what Einar said because I've got this privilege to spend quite some time in Norway last year. <laughs> I visited it several times. And I was surprised uh, how this transparency works. So that it is something what is so normal, you know, and it is so uh, very much embedded in the culture. Uh, as Einar said, you can take a look at what, what is the salary of this person and that, something what we cannot imagine already here in our country, not to, to say uh, in some other countries. So, and the second thing uh, was, and I would like really to emphasize this feeling of safety. Because no one, uh, when I talk to people in Norway, it was not, no one was worried about it once I get retired, oh, uh, will I strive or, uh, you know, uh, what shall I do, uh, where will I live and so on. So everything is transparent and uh, the system as such is, is giving you this feeling of safety. And I think it's really important. And when we discuss it then with other countries and other continents, I said that is definitely something what, uh, uh, what Norway or Nordic countries can export as uh, beneficial for the others. I mean, you cannot just copy paste it, but this is so essential because you behave completely different once you feel this, uh, that you are safe. And uh, back to democracy, what I would only, I agree with Einar, uh, what I would add is that democracy is possible when we have active citizens. 
And that has got lost somewhere. At least I see it like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that should come back as well. So to, to really enable and empower and educate people and raise the awareness of the privilege we have as citizens to contribute to the decision making. Now we are back to the decision making. But this is what I feel got lost somewhere. And for me, the democracy we have as such uh, as the system or idea is perfectly fine, but we are actually not using it, you know, because, because we are not uh, trained or we do not care or do not understand uh, the power we actually have. So that would be my comments to that, uh, to topics, yes. Thank you very much. Um, now is the last chance for our audience to maybe have one more question before we wrap up this session. Anybody else would like to? Okay, Vesna, go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. It's not a question. It's just, uh, I would just like to share some thoughts that I got while listening to all of you. Um, we were talking about the global awareness and I think it's global also because of the globalization. So I was thinking that maybe people also in the past had these thoughts and maybe they had these feelings or this awareness, but they did not have this tool to really share it to the rest of the world. Or we, we can read some books where people really share them and we can really connect with them now. But I think now for eco-civilization, this globalization, and the, we can really, really, you know, boost it and we can really um, share it. So I think that this globalization, that the, the, the way that we can really be connected, it's really so beneficial to, uh, to really bolster these um, ideas and really bolster yeah, this transition to eco-civilization. So, and regarding values, I think the values really change. So they really change through time and they really change depending on where we live. Uh, for me, they really changed for when I was young and now and now that I live in Japan and before I was living in Slovenia and they changed through time and situation. If we have war, for example, our values will change again. When there was Corona, our values changed. So they really, really are, yeah, I think that they really modify depending on the situation we are in. Um, then uh, decision-making, I think, um, so in democracy, right? Um, decision-making sh decision -making should be like a voice of, of people. So I think maybe I hope leaders decide based also on the public and what public, I think the, the most, the, the power of what we are creating is, you know, it's idea of people, it's this movement of people that are driving this and for example, European Green Deal. So it's an awareness of people. Uh, not just of, you know, one person, one leader. So I think we all are creating this and this really movement goes in this direction. And for example, circular economy is, it is a tool, but it is a manifestation of something deeper. It's really a manifestation of, yeah, that we want to create something better. We want to value the environment, for example. It's a voice of the nature because yeah, nature has no voice, environment has no voice, but we express it through these tools like circular economy and you know, eco-civilization also. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that was my... Super, thank you, Vesna. A good wrap up especially uh, from your perspective as well, and which really counts. We need to have the vision of younger generations and you still belong to that younger generation. So keep raising your voice and be actors. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, is there anybody who really wants to raise additional comment or question? Because uh, of course we would love to hear you. No? Then I will go back to the original question um, to Einar and Ladeo. Is there hope for the emergence of new civilization 
could it be eco-civilization? Will this participatory global cooperation and um, transparency uh, be strong enough to lead and to overcome this very strongly positioned currently top-down uh, sort of archaic uh, structures that are still fighting for its existence. Are we there, Einer? We are getting there. Uh, there is definitely hope. And I get hopeful every time I talk to new people and I hear new voices. Um, and um, and uh, just to refer to the last speaker as well, um, the only constant over time and the natural state of anything is change. And if you understand that and you can just really start to change the direction, which you, you are doing by increasing awareness of the alternatives, uh, you are moving everything just by exposing an ID. The ID in itself uh, is, is the strongest factor for us humans because we are imaginary beings. We have imaginations and we can understand ideas. So the idea of the eco-civilization I think uh, will be established and I think it will be, I don't know if it will be the answer but it will be a part of the answer because the mm -hmm. set of change that needs to happen and that is happening naturally now already, uh, it can set a direction for where we wanna take it. So I'm very hopeful and I think it's very important work and I think it's, very, I'm very proud and humbled and happy to be a part of it together with all of you. Thank you Thanks. very much, Einar and Ladea, the word is yours. Yeah, thank you. So uh, definitely we have to imagine things. I agree on that, that this is our uh, great uh, tool or uh, talent or whatever or gift that we have. So imagination, absolutely. And um, regarding change, as I said, uh, we are circular change uh, who, who is here to do or to contribute to the uh, circular chance. And I believe that we have this chance and I'm trying to contribute as much as I can. And regarding the, civil, the eco civilization and everything, I don't even think that it has to emerge, uh, but I think that uh, we have to recognize maybe that it is already here and that if we change uh, the way we look at things and processes and nature and everything what is under this umbrella, uh, we are so privileged that we do live in this eco-civilization. So that would be my message. Open your eyes and hearts and you will see. Thank you very much for this wisdom as well. Uh, let me wrap up also uh, this session from my side before I pass the word back to Yuri. Uh, we were today discussing uh, the society entity uh, as part of possible structure in the emerging eco-civilization as one of the key focuses. And uh, as you can see, shared value, shared vision, shared rules, shared infrastructure and mega trends were already part of it. But I think today we nail it down even better. Uh, we we uh, discussed a lot the concept of transparency, which I have to uh, share with you, I feel deeply with. I was so happy that commission uh, was uh, the only European that accepted 100 transparency in its work. And uh, it, we, we all benefited from it. We could work really uh, fully engaged with all stakeholders because everything was reported back, was transparent. And um, thank you for bringing this um, so strongly into this discussion because uh, I will confidently continue to promote it. But also all the participation, all the engagements, um, including catalysts who need to be part of it. Uh, it's a big uh, task ahead of us, but it all starts with the way how we're gonna behave tomorrow or even tonight when you leave this session, uh, how your lives will change, which elements will you take on board? Uh, and maybe at one point we will meet uh, uh, by exercising uh, these qualities and all of a sudden it will become normal. We will not be an exception anymore um, and uh, Norway will not be exception anymore in the global community um, because uh, it will emerge from all parts of the world and we have a work, the world at the table today at this session 
So I'm very excited uh, to hear from you uh, how you're going to use that and how that will impact your life. And as I already said, uh, we will continue these discussions uh, also on a communities next time bottom up where we will try to see uh, how difficult it is to uh, actually live by these new standards once you are on the ground within small circles. Because I don't think that is trivial, but it's possible. As um, our speaker said today, change is one of the most natural uh, forces of life and uh, in nature as well. So I'm very humble myself uh, with, and again, uh, very grateful for all the new wisdoms, knowledge, and uh, energies uh, that I could feel uh, from all of you. So Yuri, with that, uh, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, uh, th uh, to uh, Ladea, to Aina. Thank you, Violeta, um, and uh, to everybody else. Um, uh, in conclusion, let me um, uh, take the... Uh, 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 let, let me use the Vesna store on, on, on globalization. Um, it, it could be, of course, uh, the globalization as such that is, that is um, um, spinning uh, and then uh, allows for um, the uh, global community uh, to uh, shape up. However, um, uh, there is one factor that uh, has never been so, so decisive in the course of the, the history of any uh, society, and that is the absolute limitation of resources that we are uh, facing. And that uh, could be uh, the one that uh, really um, will um, uh, condition us as individuals, as uh, participants of uh, many other communities to also uh, uh, become part of, of a global, of the emerging global um, uh, community that could uh, be a, uh, an important pillar of uh, the rising eco-civilization as we uh, are imagining it uh, through our uh, journey. So uh, I think this was a very important um, part of our journey uh, today, very intense. Uh, thank you for your contributions. Uh, we are going to uh, continue uh, to discuss um, communities from the standpoint of identities. As Violeta said, uh, we are going to continue uh, bottom up. Uh, we uh, will re first recognize that, co that the communities shape around identities, that we actually are already uh, members of very many communities um, as we live. Uh, so uh, we are, uh, are going to ask ourselves how these communities um, are um, repositioning, how they are uh, changing and how they are uh, uh, related to the emerging uh, global uh, eco-civilization community. Um, so I'm sure it will be very, very interesting. Uh, we are going to, to talk about uh, uh, ethnic, cultural uh, co communities, uh, uh, religious, uh, racial, if you like, um, and um, we are going to uh, connect this to, uh, to today's uh, topic. I really appreciated uh, the, the uh, uh, transparency issue uh, that has come uh, in uh, today so, so many times, and um, I'm sure this will be one of the, uh, you know, um, factors that will continue emerging also in the next session. The next session is coming up on the 4th of November. Um, so there will be a little break, but it's uh, enough time to think about it, to write an essay, to maybe read an article and, and, and share the article with us so that we will continue, you know, maturing um, uh, on, on, on the communities in eco uh, during this period. I am uh, waiting you all back with us um, on the 4th of November at uh, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your contribution and have a nice uh, afternoon. Have a nice evening wherever you are. Yeah, and video, and video will be available on web pages. Everything, we'll everything is going to be shared. You, uh, yeah, you will get the link in the thank you email uh, um, uh, as, as uh, it regularly happens. Uh, uh, and uh, please consult um, 
the CBA uh, website uh, for any further information on that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye.